So first of all, let me thank you for for being here. And let me thank also the organizers and Giorgio uh, in particular for uh, inviting me here. So today I will talk about something which is uh, related to quantum mechanics, which is entanglement. I will talk about phase transitions and uh, frustrations. And uh, this is something that I've been doing maybe during the last uh, 10 to 15 years, together with Giorgio and uh, a number of other uh, friends and colleagues. So uh, the outline is the following. I, I will talk about entanglement. I will show that there is a, a uh, connection with random matrices and with frustration. And uh, let me start by uh, reminding you that Schrodinger used to say that entanglement is not one, but rather the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics. He was very concerned about this property that was emerging in quantum mechanics. Uh, this is uh, studied a lot nowadays in, uh, in, in a number of contexts, among which, uh, for instance, quantum technologies. So uh, let me start from scratch because I suppose that, uh, I mean, you, uh, you are familiar with the subject, but there are things maybe that will not be so uh, familiar. So I will focus on qubits, which are spin one-off systems. So when I talk of qubits, you have to think of a, of a spin one-off or a two-level quantum system, or C2, maybe the projective space associated to C2. And uh, of course, th a, uh, this system is dimension two. If I take n spins, n qubits, n two-level systems, the dimension becomes exponentially large in the number of qubits. So two to the power n is, is, is going to be a large number. Now I will, I will consider n spins, as I told you. And the n spins are, are taken to be in a pure state. This is a crucial assumption that I will not relax today. So these, these end spins are, 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 are described by a single pure state in a Hilbert space. And I will consider a bipartition that divides this ensemble of spins more or less in enough spins on one, half, on one side and enough spins on the other side. And this bipartition is called in, uh, in quantum uh, um, uh, mechanics and application. I, this bipartition is given and it's fixed. So I will not change this bipartition. Now, I take a pure state and I also want to take, uh, I want that this pure state be randomly chosen. So it's typical in a sense. So I need a criterion to choose this pure state on the, on the sphere of unit uh, radius on the Hilbert space. I need a criterion that I will give you in a minute. But the main idea is the following one. When I take a pure state, of course, these spins are going to be, uh, there are going to be a lot of correlations, a lot of quantum correlations, a lot of entanglement in particular. And when I cut this, the, the ensemble of spins into halves, the partition will cut a lot of uh, entanglement links, let me say, within quotes, among the spins. So the question I'm going to ask is what are the typical features of the density matrix of the subsystem? So essentially, you take n spins, you consider enough spins on one side, say the left side. I take this subsystem that is obtained by cutting, the, by, by chopping the system in two parts, and I ask what are the typical features of uh, the density matrix that describes the, uh, the subsystem. Please. Uh, when you cut the system, so you put to zero the couplings between the two sides? Uh, I'm, I'm going to come to that. I'm going to come to that. So th the question is whether you have a coupling. This is exactly my next slide. When I cut the system, whether I have a coupling. <coughs> this was exactly my next slide. I would like to warn you. I, this was exactly what I'm going to say. There is no special arrangement here. It's not that I, I'm not considering, a, a, for instance, a, a number of spins, uh, uh, say, on the plane, and I, they, they are interacting in some way, and then I chop, and then I cut among the spins with a bipartition. What I'm taking is simply a typical state of the end spins without any interaction. It is a typical state on the Hilbert space. So I'm not considering a, an array of spins that interact with them, with, among themselves, and when I cut among the spins, I have to take into account the interactions. These typical spins are just there. These spins are just there. I, I choose a random state, 
no matter what interaction there is between the spins. Of course, this is a, a, a subtle issue. But it's easier to think of the, tip of the spins uh, in, a, in a randomly chosen pure state and uh, no spatial arrangement. Let me also tell you that if you add an interaction, chances are that your correlations are going to be driven by the interaction. So this is not what I want. I, I, essentially, it's better to think of no interactions, because when I pick the spins, I know that they are free to be, let me say, with an abuse of, of language, typical on the Hilbert space. If I add an interaction, typicality will be lost. Okay, the second warning is the following one. This state is typical, so I just to chose uh, one and zero means spin up and spin down, or level up or level down. And for instance, is, is I, I told you that these spins are in a typical state, so the spins are, can be in this state, or I can add another direction in the Hilbert space, or I can add another direction in the Hilbert space, and so on. Of course, I have to renormalize the vector as I keep adding directions, and maybe I have to put some coefficients there. But essentially, you see, when I keep adding states, I have two to the power n available states, because the Hilbert space is huge. There are a lot of combinations there. So when I think about a typical state, I mean a state in which, presumably, most of these directions in this huge Hilbert space are going to be involved. And notice that since this is a pure state, when I cut uh, and I divide the system in two, by, in two subsystems, no spin is going to be in a pure state. I mean, cl in classical language, no spin is going to be pointing in some given direction. Because, for instance, take this spin. The, I, I mean, I'm, I'm using a classical uh, drawing, which is wrong by definition. Take this spin in particular. When I, when I chop between left and right, it is clear that this gray spin there will be uh, will have correlation with this spin, with this spin, with all the spins. So by dividing this, the, the, in two subsystems, it is clear that this spin taken individually cannot be in a pure state because I'm, I'm chopping out all. Yes, I'm projecting one half. Yes, so I'm going to be I'm, I'm going to uh, be a little bit more technical in a minute. I'm tracing out one of. Typically, how many cases would you have in the sum? I'm missing the question. How many contributions would you have in the sum? Two to the n, of course, two to the n contributions in general. Modulo normalization. So two to the power n minus one. A lot of contributions. Plus, uh, I mean, I have, there are constraints like normalization, a global phase, but essentially the, the number of dimensions I've available are two to the n. And the, the, all of them are going to be involved in the sum, with the right coefficients that I didn't write there. OK, so now let me be a little bit more technical. So I take n spins. I have a Hilbert space, which is the tensor plot of the two Hilbert spaces. I take these two, uh, uh, for simplicity, I take the two by partition to, be, to have the same size. So the dimension of the total Hilbert space scales like n squared. This is 2 to the n divided by 2. This is the size of the subsystem. I take a pure state, as I told you, and I take the reduced density matrix of A. So as you were suggesting, I'm tracing out part B of the system, and I'm left with a density matrix that describes only part A. Now I'm going to choose a particular function. I'm going to choose what is called purity, which is the trace of rho squared. And this is a good measure of the bipartite entanglement between A and B. Let me tell you, I will come back to this point, that this quantity, uh, the purity, is the same. The purity of A is the same as the purity of B. And this is the range. It ranges between 1 over n and 1. So let me give you a few examples, because I want to clarify what these two limits represent. So first of all, uh, let me start from, a, from what, what is called in the literature the Schmidt decomposition. So I take the pure state and I write it in this way. This can always be done and it takes no loss of generality. So I, I choose, uh, I take these coefficients, this lambda i, ui pertains to system A and vi pertains to system B. This is the density matrix. This is what I obtain when I trace out system B here. And of course, the density matrix has all the eigenvalues on the diagonal due to this particular decomposition. Then I can rotate this matrix. But essentially, this is the density matrix of system A. 
purity, which is the trace of rho squared, is simply the sum of these eigenvalues, the sum, sorry, of the square of the eigenvalues, and this is a very good measure of entanglement. It's one of the possible measure of the, of the correlations. Let me give you a few examples so uh, uh, hopefully I make things a little bit more clear. So this is my original system. Assume that party A, so this subsystem, is factorized. So if it is factorized, the total wave function of system A plus B is gonna, can be written in this way, and therefore the density matrix looks like this. So it is clear, and the purity, which is the square of this uh, coefficient, is just one. This is one of the two limits we were, uh, I was mentioning before. Of, uh, of this quantity. It's one of the two possible limits. This limit is obtained essentially when there is no correlation between system A and system B. Uh, let me make a physical comment. It is clear that if you choose the, the pure state uh, randomly, according to some criterion, this situation is going to be very unlikely. You, you have to be very lucky that you pick a system in which half of the spins in this room, say, are not correlated to the other half if you pick the state randomly. So this situation will never occur. Nonetheless, if this is the situation, the density matrix looks like this and purity is one. This is one of the two limits. So purity one means no correlation between the two subsystems. Let me look at the opposite case. When the Schmidt decomposition is this form, so when it involves a lot of states and between party A and party B, and part B. When I trace out VI, I end up with this density matrix. Notice the normalization there. So if I take the sum of the square of these coefficients, this is 1 over n squared times n, and purity is 1 over n. So the two limits are easy to understand. In one limit, when purity is 1, is when there is no correlation between A and B. In the other limit, purity is 1 over n, when the correlation is maximal between party A and party B. This is summarizing maximal entanglement, so a lot of correlations, and factorized. I remind you that I chose, I chose a given bipartition. I'm not changing the bipartition. The bipartition is given, so these state are maximally entangled or factorized according to the cut. I'm, I'm fixing the cut. The question is what happens in between? And this leads me to, to bipartite entanglement. The distribution eigenvalue is completely different in, two in the two cases. So is the purity that I've chosen as a measure of entanglement. And what I want to do is to study the distribution of the eigenvalues conditioned to the value of purity. So I want, I fix the bipartition, I fix purity, so I condition the distribution of the eigenvalues, and I want to study the distribution of these eigenvalues conditioned to the value of purity. Uh, so now let me uh, go back to uh, simpler situation. Take an ideal gas in different containers. This is the Maxwell distribution, the distribution of the speeds of the particle in this gas. This is the distribution as a function of temperature. So you change temperature and the distribution is different shapes. It is the same distribution with a different parameter. So in a way you are conditioning the distribution of the speeds of the molecules of the gas to temperature. And I want to ask the same, the same question for entanglement. I will have a distribution of eigenvalues that represent entanglement. I want to condition this distribution to purity that gives me a measure of the amount of entanglement. And I want to study how, the, how this distribution will change as a function of temperature. In other words, as a function of purity. So purity is going to be my Lagrange multiplier. Okay, now if you pick a random box, chances are, that, and you look for the, the speeds, the velocities of the molecules at a given temperature, chances are that you will find the, the Maxwell distribution. So it is going to be very unlikely, in fact it's exponentially suppressed, the idea that you have a distribution which is not Maxwell, which is not uh, uh, given by uh, the Maxwellian. In the same way, if I pick a, pure, a, a, random, a, a, a random pure state, 
and I fix purity, which plays the role of temperatures, and I look for the eigenvalues of our system, it's going to be very unlikely to find a distribution in the thermodynamical limit. It's going to be very unlikely that I find a distribution that it looks different from the distribution I'm going to find, if I'm lucky enough to find the distribution, of course. OK, so this is the main idea. Now let me be a little bit more technical. I will fix purity, so I will fix the amount of entanglement between the two given by partitions. I will pick a generic state, and I will find the distribution of the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix for different purities. So this is the strategy. It's as if you fix temperature and you look for the distribution of the speeds of the molecule in a box in exactly this way. OK. Now I have to give a, a criteria to define random states. What is a random state? I have to take the uniform measure on the unit sphere, and I choose the hard measure on the unitary group, which is a measure that preserves something, preserves volumes. OK? So this is the criteria. When I choose a random state, randomness is defined according to this criteria. This is the, what I would call the democracy. Democracy means according to this rule. OK, intermezzo, which is related maybe to, to the question that was asked at the beginning. Of course, you may wonder, how do I generate a typical state? This question was asked, was uh, solved by Scott and Case, by Cassati, Benente, and their group. Essentially, if you take a quantum sawtooth map, among other things, the states become typical enough. So a chaotic dynamics will generate random states. I'm cheating a little bit. It does not generate exactly random states, but it's a good approximation. It generates states that are almost random, given a few conserved quantities. They are almost random, in a f and they, it's, they're fastly approached. So there is a way to generate this random state in practice by a chaotic dynamic, as you may expect. OK. I take, as I said, the, uh, the, uh, the uniform measure on the unit sphere, as I told you before. So I start from some state, and I know how to generate all these random states. And I look, this, was maybe, this is maybe related to the question by Enzo at, at, at the beginning. I look at the induced measure on the reduced density matrix, given that psi is randomly chosen. So there is going to be a, me a democratic measure on the sphere, but I'm going to trace out half of the system. So I want to know what is the induced metric, the induced metric on the density matrix. This question was solved. Uh, I will give you a little bit more details uh, in the following. And you may ask a number of questions. One of these questions is, uh, was posed and asked by Lobkin in, uh, in a rather mathematical paper uh, 40 years ago. So if you take a typical state, what is the typical value of purity? So the typical value of this quantity, given the, measure, given the hard measure on the sphere. This typical value of purity is 2 over n. So you see that, uh, let me remind you, maybe I should have put a reminder. 2 over n is very close to the minimum. Right? The, the range of purity is 1 and 1 over n. So 2 over n is very close to the minimum. And this is intuitive, because if you pick a random state on the sphere, state on the sphere, there are 100 spins in this room. Every head is a spin. And you divide the room in two parts. Chances are there are going to be a lot of correlation between the two parties. Right? So it is clear that this state, this state is going to give purity, which is almost minimum due to these correlations, due to the randomness of the state. So this result is easy to understand intuitively. It's close to the, to, to the minimum. And uh, my friend uh, Paolo Facchi was working with me on this problem. It found, I found this sentence curious, in particular in a conference that involves George, who's a profound thinker. This is the incipit, the, the starting. The, the, the paper by Lopkin starts like this. He finds his order in the initial state of the universe repugnant. Furthermore, a pure state remains pure. Entropy is somehow to be developed without fundamental entropy. This makes me think of... Uh, how can I say? Structures, in a way. If you don't impose some structures, uh, things are too chaotic to do anything uh, 
to, to extract anything out of them. Okay, well, this was the, the first moment, the average of purity. What about the variance? The variance can be calculated directly, and it scales like two, uh, like one over n to the fourth power. This calculation is difficult. It's sensitive because uh, there are uh, uh, terms that cancel when you compute this quantity, and this is the final result. This was obtained 20 years later, so it took 20 years to find the first moment. After that, there is a beautiful paper by Giraud, another 15 years, in which he computes up to the fifth moment of this distribution. So we know a lot of things. We know uh, the average, we know the first moment, we know the first five moments. So luckily enough, we were able to, Georgia, to find the whole distribution. So let me tell you how you compute the whole distribution. Uh, just a quick tutorial on concentration of measure. I'm sure you're familiar with the idea. So if you take a sum of independent random variables uh, of order one, the central limit theorem will tell you that this quantity, the sum, behaves like the square root of n. So there is a sharp concentration uh, that the value of this sum can take, and this is the result you get. Now this is very easy to, to extend to the non-commutative case, and you have the semicircle, Wigner semicircle law. So if you take a spectral distribution of random matrices, this is the distribution of the eigenvalues of a random matrix. So it is exactly the same. It's, uh, there is a sharp concentration, and the law is given by Wigner semicircle. So these are phenomena of concentration of measure. Uh, well, I, I can talk to a lot of people in the audience. This is exactly what happens with Maxwell when you have the Maxwellian distribution. And this is what's going to happen with the distribution of the eigenvalues. Now, let me uh, be a little bit more technical. I told you that I have a pure state, and I want to understand what is the induced, ma given that this is all distributed, so this is randomly picked, I want to know to what is the, the measure on the density matrix. And the measure of the density matrix was found by Diskowski and, uh, and Sommers, and essentially, modulo a factor, it is given by this uh, uh, probability distribution. So you see, this is the measure on, uh, this is a part of the measure that I have to use for the density matrix. This, uh, this is the relevant part. And this relevant part is, of course, you have to integrate over, over all the eigenvalues, and this distribution looks like this. And now this is interesting because this is eigenvalue repulsion. So if you look at this uh, in a minute, this is going to be a cost function, and uh, you see that the eigenvalue repel each other with a quadratic law. I'm going to come back to this. OK. Now, uh, yeah, so let me give you an idea. If I take the Hilbert space of the whole system, uh, I take the Hilbert space, and I look for, for purity of the subsystem that I was telling you. It is clear that there are going to be manifolds in which the states in this manifold take a given value of purity. The states of this, in this manifold take another value of purity, and so on. So I will call this isopurity manifold. All the states in those manifolds are characterized by having the same value of purity. So isopurity means that these states here have the same entanglement, by definition. And I want to know what is the typical distribution of the eigenvalues on each manifold. This is the question that was posed by Kuss, Diskoski, and Poleska. This is already 15 years ago. OK, I told you what is the measure. I want to find the most probable spectrum. So I have to look at the, the, this, the, the distribution of the eigenvalues that maximizes a given probability, given a, a purity that I fix. And this is a constrained optimization problem because I want to look for the most probable value given a given purity that will characterize the manifold. OK, the reminder is not necessary anymore. Ah, yes, it is necessary, because typical states that I told you of in the beginning will be reobtained as a particular case. So if I fix, this is, this is going to be done for any value of purity. In particular, if I fix purity to be the purity of the uh, typical states, as a particular case, I will reobtain the distribution 
of the, of the eigenvalues in, a, in the typical case. Now, how do I set the problem? I have to define a cost function, V, a potential, and this potential is given by, I'm going to exponentiate this quantity, so it's given by twice the logarithm of this, this, this yields this uh, potential, this will fix the value of purity, and this will fix normalization. So I have to study the eigenvalues under these two constraints given this potential. So this is a gas of eigenvalues on the interval, so the problem is set, it is reduced to the ga gas of eigenvalues on the interval. I have a repulsive 2D Coulomb problem, I have a harmonic something, and this is essentially it's related to Dyson's ideas of the early 60s. I have a hard wall from positivity because the eigenvalues cannot be negative due to, because these are the eigenvalues of a reduced density matrix, so represent probabilities. And there is a hard wall from unit trace because the sum of the eigenvalues must be one. So the problem is set. I have two boundary conditions that I have to take into account and uh, a potential. Okay, I look for the set of point equations. These are the set of point equations, the trace condition, I fix purity as I told you before, and the set of point equation look like this. This is the set of point equation that I have to study with the trace condition and with something that fixes the value of purity, which is a Lagrange multiplier. It's like temperature, it's a Lagrange multiplier. Now this is a, a known equation, and this equation is known to have solutions in a compact support. So what, I, what one has to do is to solve this equation, and this is the solution. I, I, I just give you the solution. So this is when purity range between, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm rescaling purity here. I'm getting rid of the factor one over n. So all these eigenvalues are not centered around one, are centered very close to zero because you have to divide them by n. So this is the distribution of the eigenvalues for this range of purity, 1 over n and 5 over 4 n. I remind you that you cannot go below 1 over n uh, uh, because the, that was the minimum, the minimum of purity. And this is the distribution. It's big in a semicircle. So, from the, so in practice, you, solved, you have solved the problem because you fix purity, and here you can compute all the moments. Okay, you have the distribution. It looks like the semicircle. Vigner semicircle. If you change purity between five over, uh, 5 over 4 and 2, this is the distribution. It's Marchenko Pasteur. By the way, these are the typical states. So the typical states that I told you at the beginning have a distribution of eigenvalue that looks like this. So this solves the first question I asked. But of course, it solves a number of other questions. So I told you, I have uh, a sphere, I pick a random state, I, I cut it into two. What is the distribution of the eigenvalues of half system? It is this one. It is Marchenko Pasteur. So the relation, the, the links with random matrices uh, becomes obvious here. Now, clearly, by changing purity, you, the distribution will change from semicircle to Marchenko Pasteur. When will this change? Uh, take place. Essentially it takes place when the distribution of the eigenvalues, the green one, becomes red and then becomes blue. You see, when the distribution will touch the origin because the eigenvalues cannot become negative. That's the way uh, the distribution behaves. This is interesting, it's something that to tell you the truth I still don't understand clearly. There is an accumulation of eigenvalues close to zero. And they accumulate close to zero, and then all this region is of order 1 over n, by the way. Okay, so essentially purity looks a little bit like that. Maybe I should put order 1 over n, order 1 over n, order 1 over n, not exactly 1 over n. This is the limit, but uh, the distribution looks like this. Okay, so this solves the problem, at least in this uh, range of parameters. The phase transition, when uh, this point will touch here, it's related to the breaking of the Z2 symmetry, and it's where Marchenko Pasteur becomes Wegener in this sense. So the distribution of the eigenvalue of the reduced antithematic change shape in, in this way. 
Sorry? Uh, can I come back to this point in a minute? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I would like not to run out of time. Sorry, I'm, I, I, I will answer later. Okay, uh, there is something interesting, and uh, this is one of Giorgio's intuitions. So, I, um, of course, we worked at it very hard. Assume that you change purity, and uh, you make purity large. Say, let me say, of course, this is unlikely that this happens because you cut the system in two halves and you demand that half of the system is a, a large purity. So say one third or 0 0.27 or something of order one. Okay. It is clear that you are constraining the problem a lot because random states will not look like this. These states are going to be exponential suppressed, exponentially suppressed. Nonetheless, re re demand that purity be a large number, say 0 0.25, 0 0.37, something of order one. Well, what you find is that the distribution of eigenvalues still remains uh, Marchenko-Pastur, but one eigenvalue evaporates out of this continuum of order 1 over n and becomes finite. Now, this, to me, it was not obvious. I would suppose it's not obvious to a, a standard physicist like myself. Because you may wonder, how come I, I cut the system into two parts? Why should there not be two eigenvalues or three eigenvalues? Why only one? Well, this is what happens. You have only one eigenvalue. So purity is like this. There is a one eigenvalue that essentially takes the whole weight of the constraints plus a correction. So in practice, all the eigenvalues are, are, are of order 1 over n and give these tiny contributions. And there is going to be one eigenvalue that contributes to most of purity. The answer was given by Giorgio, one of those intuitions we are all familiar with. Because this is the energetically, uh, it's a cost function. So the, the easiest way from the energetic point of view is to make one eigenvalue evaporate, not two, not three, not four. You can think about it. We are, yesterday we were making fun of George's intuitions. You don't really know where they come from, but the explanation is good. So this is the simplest way to take, to take into account the constraint. OK, this phase transition is of first order. Uh, these are all the phase transitions that take place in the system. You change purity between the minimum and the maximum. And this is what happens. It's a semicircle. Then it becomes marchenko pastur And then one eigenvalue evaporates and becomes of order one. We found the metastable branch. And here, by the way, this is related to gravity in two dimensions, which was found by Antonello Scardicchio. OK, so far purity. I want to be very fast. This can be generalized to many rainy entropies. So this is the isopurity manifold. You can go from isopurity to von Neumann entropy. The manifolds will change. And you can study this problem. And surprisingly, no, I mean, this is the way you define the potential. Notice that you don't have lambda square, uh, you don't have, uh, sorry, you still have the repulsive two Coulomb potential. This, this comes from, this comes, this comes from uh, the measure on the Haar sphere. So you cannot discuss with this. But the potential is not lambda square anymore, it's lambda log lambda. So you change the potential. This is a, a difficult problem. And uh, you have a deformed semicircle. Again, you have a, an analytic solution for this distribution. I don't want to go into these details. You have deformed Machenko Pasteur, one eigenvalue evaporates. There are a few things that change. For instance, this transition becomes first order, uh, becomes, sorry, second order. But essentially, the phenomenon is the same. OK, now I'm, uh, I'm done. No, I want to explain you where multipartite entanglement comes from. And I want to give you a recipe. Sorry, I made something wrong because I changed this transparency this, uh, uh, this morning. So I will use statistical methods in order to define multipartite entanglement. I will go back to the concept in a minute. And uh, the, there is a lot of attention in the literature. This is, uh, there is, there's been a recent paper by Smerti on this subject. But the seminal idea comes from uh, Manco, Marmo, Sudarshan, and Zakaria, and of course from uh, Giorgio's ideas on complex systems. Essentially, the idea is the following. Rather than fixing the bipartition like I was doing before, I will change the bipartition. 
And in practice, I require that every time I change the bipartition, I look for the entanglement between the two parties, but the bipartition is going to change every time. You see? OK, so let me be fast. Of course, this is the average of purity, so the average of entanglement with the right factors. I take balance by partition, enoughs and enoughs, or almost enough and enoughs, and purity is going to inherit, uh, sorry, average purity is going to inherit the same bounds as purity, because it's an average. Now, this is one of those surprises. You start from a pure state. These ZKs are the, co the disease are the coefficient of the pure state. And you look for the average purity when you change the bipartitions. You change across all bipartitions. Uh, the, uh, the function that couples the coefficients of the wave function, this coupling function, is a complicated expression. Now, this is a classical theory. So somehow you have reduced your problem to a classical theory, because the ZK, these are complex numbers. So it's a classical theory in which you try to, for instance, to minimize multipartite entanglement over a collection of complex numbers given a coupling. I find this ironical, because entanglement is the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics, yet we reduce it to a classical uh, theory, if you think about it. This is when, unfortunately, Paolo Facchi was not with us yesterday at the, I should have taken the, uh, we should have taken the picture with Paolo too. When we started our collaboration with Giorgio, we went to ask this question. Because we felt somehow with, uh, with Paolo and, and Antonello that this problem is uh, not only frustrated, that I will show you in a minute, but also, um, uh, how can I say, there is a replica symmetry somewhere. We are still unable to find it, but uh, I'm running out of time. I thought that it would be fun to, to, to uh, talk about frustration in a minute. But uh, uh, let me jump over this. I will not. Uh... OK, take the case n equal 4. So there are four qubits, four two-level systems. And I divide in two halves in this way. And I require, for example, that purity be minimal. Minimal purity is 1 fourth in this case, 1 over 2 to the n divided by 2. Now, I take another bipartition, and I require that also pi prime be 1 fourth in such a way that the average purity is still 1 fourth. I can satisfy this requirement. If I add the only remaining bipartition, this requirement cannot be satisfied anymore. OK, so this requirement of having, for instance, minimal purity can be satisfied for one bipartition, for two bipartitions, but not for the third one. So it is clear that if you keep adding bipartitions, if you keep cutting the system in different ways, at some point this requirement are going to be conflictual. And that's where frustration comes from. This is what happens for seven and eight qubits. You see, you can keep, this is the minimum, at some point, this jumps. And you, your demand that, for instance, purity be minimal cannot be satisfied anymore. So it is interesting to look at the fractional balance by partitions. Um, this is a bit technical. This is what, when you randomly extract partition among seven qubits. It is clear that there is, uh, at some point, that two thirds of these partitions uh, you should get a phase transition. Uh, and it is related to frustration. Let me conclude quickly. The right way to do this is to, to, to build a Hamiltonian, a cost function, which is defined in terms of the uh, weights of the wave function. You take a partition function, you define an inverse temperature, you take the Haar measure, the induced measure, and you, you study this system in a classical statistical mechanical setting. When beta goes to infinity, you have the minimizers of the Hamiltonian, which we call mess. 
when beta goes to zero, essentially you cancel this factor, you have only the measure, and you have the typical states, which is a, a particular case. And here you have, when beta goes to infinity, you are weighting this in the wrong way, within quotes, and you have the maximizers of the Hamiltonian, which are the separable states. You see that when you, these are typical states, so you, you can ask and answer a, diffi a different question. You have a collection of, of, of two-level systems, of, of uh, spins, and you ask, what is the typical entanglement, the typical average entanglement, if I keep changing the bipartition? And it's 2 over the square root of it. This is essentially the same result that you have if, we, if you fix the bipartition. And if you think about it, it's obvious. Because if the state is randomly chosen, it doesn't matter if you bipartite it this way or this way or whichever way. It's not going to be sensitive to the bipartition in this particular case. So as usual, when you generalize the problem, you get insights into different properties of the system. Uh, yes, I would like to conclude with this. We compute, this problem is much tougher to, to study. We computed the, the, the first few cumulants of the cost functions. And these cumulants have this strange, uh, depend. these numbers are uh, transcendental. I'm going to finish. And uh, maybe you can ask Giorgio why this is interesting when you have transcendental exponents in the, in the cumulant expansion. So this is something exciting in a way. We don't understand why. OK. Giorgio, uh, in Italian, più che un privilegio è stato un piacere. I cannot translate this in English. It was not a privilege so much, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we have time for one or two very quick questions. Yes. yes. Can you say something about applications? Yes, you have to go close to quantum phase transitions. It is known that you take a, a spin system, for example, a spin system, I, I take the example of qubits, but you, qubit is just an example. You can do it with any n level system. It is known that when you get close to the phase transition, entanglement uh, develops singularities, which uh, we know. So it is obvious that entanglement can be taken as a, a, an indicator of the phase transition. So applications, there are a lot of applications in quantum phase transition. Practical applications, they are still a little bit remote in my opinion. Maybe when we will have a, a rudimental quantum computer or a quantum simulator, I would say five, six years, maybe we can look for better. There are some simulators, but it's a bit uh, too early. We have to be patient, a few years, I think. More questions? If not, thank you. For thank you very much. Thank you.